Uh, you should be able to hear and see the screen. Um, it's a very busy screen. I think that's what you're looking at. Okay, good. So I wanted to, uh, let's get going. And again, if you have any questions, comments, any markets you want to look at, you can always type that throughout the session and we will uh, likely get to it uh, before we're done. Okay. So I deliver sessions in the mornings and um, and these are sessions that have, uh, so obviously they're, most of the session is trading, live trading and analysis where we set up trades, take trades, all for daily income, weekly income, and building and protecting that longer term wealth. Okay, so um, always applying the same rule-based strategy that I developed uh, many, many years ago on the trading floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, right? So it's all around supply and demand, meaning we are um, attempting to answer two questions, right? Where is market price? Where are market prices going to turn, and where are they going to go? To answer those two questions objectively with a simple set of rules, we focus on the market's real supply and demand, identifying price points where supply and demand is out of balance in a big way, where banks and financial institutions are buying and selling, so that we can buy and sell there also. And we really focus on where you have pockets of significant unfilled buy and sell orders. That's where prices turn. And then we also look at a chart and clearly identify price levels where most of the orders are filled because that facilitates price movement. So that's how we answer the two questions. Where is price going to turn and where is it going to go? I wanted to start with a, a screenshot that you see here. This is from one of my morning sessions the other day. And um, if you don't know who Paul Tudor Jones is, he's an interesting guy, um, very successful trader. And But the, uh, the, the key with him is, look at how he made money, right? He says, I believe the very best money is made at m the market turns. Everyone says you get killed trying to pick tops and bottoms, and you make all your money by playing the trend in the middle. Well, for 12 years, I've been missing the meat in the middle, but I've made a lot of money at tops and bottoms. Does everybody understand that? Okay. Because there's always this push to just, you know, focus on the trend and, you know, uh, and stuff like that. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with trend. Just make sure you understand what the word trend means. The word trend means price is moving in one direction. If we wait for a big move up in price before we start buying, that's not low risk, high high reward and, and high odds, right? If we wait for prices to drop significantly till we have a strong downtrend in a way before we start selling short, that's not low risk, high reward and high probability. You see what I'm saying? So what he's saying here, I'm just giving you very specific and simple rules around that. Okay. All right, let's move on to the price charts. So let me know, can you see um, uh, the charts now or do I have to reshare? I can probably reshare. Um, there we go, you should be able to see Um, yeah, okay, so you should be able to see the charts. So let's go in and apply our rule-based strategy. And as we do that, I also want to, you know what, before we get into the charts, let me share uh, one more thing with you here. And um, give me just a second. I think this is really important. Then we'll just go and apply all this stuff. So, okay, let's go back here. So now you can see the uh, PowerPoint again. Okay. So um, you can see the, the, the green and red guys. You guys see that? Okay, let me, uh, let me make sure that's visible. Oh, here we go. Well, before I show that, before I get into that, price charts, okay, like, like um, so let's look at this price charts, right? What do price charts show you? Like, what do the candles actually represent? Someone help me out with all this. What do the price charts actually represent? Filled orders. When an order gets filled, you see it on the screen exactly. 
Um, what causes prices to turn, though? Do filled orders cause prices to turn? Or do unfilled orders cause prices to turn? Right, here's a couple of our supply zones filled with unfilled orders. Right. Okay, remember, unfilled orders cause prices to turn. And we'll get into this in a little bit. So if you think about it, not only does a price chart show us not show us what we need to see, it actually shows us the opposite picture of what we need to see. The price chart shows us filled orders, but who cares about filled orders, right, as far as price is turning? Prices turn at levels where you have significant unfilled orders, right? So again, not only does a price chart not show us no, what we need to see, it shows us the opposite of what we need to see. <clears throat> so if I, um, let's do a little exercise here. If we change the price chart from representing filled orders to unfilled orders, what would it look like? Filled orders to unfilled orders, what would it look like? It would look like this. Uh, let me share this with you. Okay. So now, can you see the red and green guys now? You should be able to see that. Okay. Right? Okay, so <clears throat> up where supply greatly exceeds demand, you're gonna you're gonna see very few candles on on the screen, but that's because you have so much supply, so many willing sellers. Just like down at demand, all right, you're gonna see the 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 actual, um, you know, demand, right? If there's a lot of demand, like you see here, what that's going to look like on a price chart is very little trading because supply and demand is so out of balance, you don't get much trading. So the visual of filled orders and unfilled orders is literally opposite. Just like in the middle, you don't have an overwhelming amount of supply and demand. You can buy and sell as, as, you know, as much as you want here. Price isn't gonna move too much because it's, your supply and demand is not that out of balance. So you're going to get many at 50, for example, you're gonna get many candles on the screen. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Okay, so when your eyes see a price chart, it could be a candlestick chart, line chart, bar chart, point and figure, whatever, tick chart, bottom chart, anything. When your eyes see that, your brain needs to process what you see on the screen right now because it is literally the opposite picture. Most people don't think of it like that. Okay. Let's go to charts again. And you should be able to see, um, there you go. You should be able to see the charts. You see that? So now in here, where all this trading activity is, that's that's filled orders, right? Look at the very little trading out here at our supply zones. That's up where there we had a ton of those green guys up here. Does that make sense? You don't get a lot of trading up here because you have all that competition to sell. So I want to make sure that you get the logic around all this. We never really spend time on this part of it. Okay, and the next thing before we um, move on, and we'll get there, we'll get to, the, we're going to spend plenty of time on the charts, is, okay, so I want to go over profit targets. Does anybody have an issue with profit targets? Uh, in my mind, from my experience, every Every bit of this needs to be mechanical. You have to have a set of rules, a simple set of rules that makes perfect logical sense all around the whole concept of supply and demand, right? Okay. All right, so take a look. So I'm going to go over two types of targets. Take a look at the screen. Here we have our supply zone. This is an actual trade that we put out in the morning sessions. Um, here's a supply zone. We have our pattern, very little trading, strong drop in price from the level. Price then goes all the way down to here before returning back to the supply zone where we'd sell short. Okay, so think about it. Once we have our supply zone established, we have a pretty good idea of where prices are likely to turn but now, where are they likely to move to? Remember question number two. Well, the fact that price went all the way down to here tells us that we can't have any significant demand above that price, right? 
Because when, when we're at our supply zone and we and we you know our supply zone meets our criteria, then we concern ourselves with demand. Okay, we know where retail prices are, but where are wholesale prices? So here's demand, but where is I'm sorry, here's supply, but where's demand? Well, this chart doesn't tell us where demand is, but it tells us where it's not. It can't be above this price. Does everybody understand that? If there was significant demand above this price, would price have ever traded here? No. Now you may say, well, what if what if some new demand comes in, you know, when price comes back up? Yeah, there's always new demand, but nothing significant, nothing we care about. We want the whole my, the, my whole strategy focuses on okay. Whole strategy focuses on where are significant banks, financial institutions, the big smart money buying and selling. All right? Okay. All right, makes sense. So, therefore, now how do we think about profit targets? There's two profit targets that we use. Um, we call them the easy money profit zone target and the big money profit target. So let me show you how this works. And that 90 should really be, um, I don't use 90, but let me, let me go here for you. Um, I actually use for myself uh, 80. All right, just want to be really accurate for you. Okay, so there's two types of profit targets. Once you have a supply zone or a demand zone, you measure the distance from your proximal line here down to the low, whatever this price is, okay, and then take a certain percentage of that. Okay, the reason why we don't want a profit target right here at the low is because there's likely to be competition to buy there, right? Demand turned price higher there, so there's going to be competition to buy. If we have sold short and we have to buy back our long position, we don't want to buy when there's competition to buy. We want to buy when there's competition to sell. Okay, so um, so therefore, you always want to take a percentage or a portion of your available profit zone. Does that make sense? So because the sellers were able to take price all the way down to here, right? Because supply exceeded demand down to this point. This group did all the dirty work for us so that when we get in, we want a very attainable target. So I'll ch I typically choose like 80% of whatever this is, and now it becomes very mechanical. And that's the easy money target. Okay, all that matters is where significant buy and sell orders are and where they are not. The big money profit target is uh, we want to look for the opposing demand zone. So let's focus up here. We have our supply zone. Here's price comes all the way down. Here's the low. So we take the distance between this proximal line and the low and a certain percentage of that becomes our easy money profit target. But if you want to go for the bigger money profit target, you find the opposing demand zone, which which in this case was right here. Make sense? OK, and you go for the bigger move. Any questions on that? I know I'm giving you to you kind of quick here. OK. Um, I'm short this, uh, this is a position I'm in right now, by the way. Um, the profit target for me is, let's see, it's 36. So just full disclosure. Um, I'm sorry, 37.50. So we need to go a little bit lower. And um, I'll always tell you, if we're looking at a market and I'm in a trade, I'll, I'll tell you that. All right. So uh, this is the S&P. Now I can look at any market you want to look at. I want to, as we go into the markets now, I want to make sure that we apply, you know, some of what we've been talking about. Okay, supply, demand, the basics of, core, of the strategy, and then, of course, profit targets. So, if you have markets that, if you have markets, um, sorry, I had a little cough there. If you have markets you want me to look at, just let me know. Otherwise, I have a pretty big list to uh, go through. All right. I don't know if we'll get to all of them, but let's see. <clears throat> oh, the nifty. <clears throat> you know, I don't believe I get the nifty on TradeStation. I've never tried, but uh, I doubt it. Um, okay. But we can look at, uh, yeah. No, we can certainly look at the, we can, anything. Let's go right to the currencies. Let's start with the dollar. If we're going to look at the currencies, 
we always want to start with the uh, with the dollar. So let's go to the dollar. The dollar hasn't really changed much uh, um, in um, in a bit. <clears throat> we want to start with our larger time frame chart and work our way down. There we go. So let's do that. Here's our weekly chart of the dollar. And for those who have been with me in FX Street for uh, a number of years, you know you know how much we focus on the dollar. Right, the dollar is key. Okay. And right now, price is just wedged in between this demand and supply. Our new levels are above and below, but uh, obviously take quite a bit of time for price to get there. Um, Coming down to the daily chart, there's not a whole lot more information there. So I want to bring you to the four hour chart. This is kind of the one we've been really working off of. And I'm assuming you could see the charts now. Um, not a whole lot to get excited about when we're in the middle. Okay, remember, and I'll share this with you. Okay. So you see where price is right now? And you see where our supply and demand zones are in the dollar? And those are our big significant ones. On smaller time frames, there's others. But you see where that is? Don't forget, in my mind, I always know where we're at here. So the dollar is somewhere kind of in here right now. Does everybody understand that? Your brain needs to be processing that constantly. In fact, that's really all that matters. Right? Okay. Let's go back to the charts, right? So we're kind of not in the middle, but but anyway, you know where we're at in the big picture. Let's go down and look at the, uh, oh, let's look at a smaller time frame here. Um, I think there was something on the, yes. So if the dollar does rally, uh, you won't see these t levels on larger time frames, but right around 9605, uh, be aware that there's a supply zone there. And then again, there's a couple more higher on smaller time frames, but 96.05 is where the dollar is likely to run into some short-term trouble um, and look for a pullback there. So if you're looking to take a daily income type trade or weekly income type trade off the euro or one of those, um, those will probably be coming into, especially the euro will probably be coming into a demand zone at that time. But I always want to match, you know, line that up with the with the dollar. Go to the euro, and if you want me to use, you know, typically I would use the futures, but if you want me to go to the spot market, I can do that also. Okay. Again, here's that weekly chart that's going to look very similar to the dollar. No problem going to the spot market if you want me to. Here's a trade that we took uh, last week in the morning sessions. It uh, did hit our 13 to 1 profit target. Again, just selling short at supply where banks are selling. And we were selling to people, novice traders, who were buying after a rally in price and into a price level where supply exceeds demand. And then uh, we chose our easy money profit target down here. You see how we applied that? And of course, we're very big on set and forget trading. Set and forget trading. Okay. Um, if the dollar, uh, so I give you a couple small time frame supply zones above. If the dollar does come down, I'm sorry, this is the euro. <laughs> Uh, but with the euro, watch the 113.70. And again, we're looking at the futures. That's 113.70. And then I do have, um, I believe there's some levels up here. Let's take a look. Yeah. Uh, we're pretty far from this at the moment. So, yeah, no, never mind. We're too far from that. Okay. Uh, the other thing I would point your eye to if you're looking for some. Uh, some daily uh, daily income opportunities. If the euro does come down, <clears throat> it's going to hit you know these these uh, two or three demand zones here. And what you might want to consider doing is uh, combining these two and turning these two into one. Really starting at the 114.20, right around 114.20, down to uh, about 114.10. Okay. Not so much that one, but combining uh, the bottom part of that one and all of that one. All right. Oh, that circle there, we were just doing like a little less than the other day. I think that's what that's from. Okay, let's go to the Aussie dollar. And 
you know, we've been watching the Aussie dollar for a couple of weeks now, just price, you know, trading up into this area. Uh, no surprise, it's, it's uh, you know, we've been trying to position short here for the Aussie dollar. But if we come down to the 60 minute chart, I think you'll see uh, these are some fresh levels that are not that far from current price, starting at 72.66, and that's found on the 60-minute chart. Okay. All right, no questions on that one. And you have like two or three levels on top of each other, but it's really not that big, uh, it's not that huge of an area. And of course, watch the dollar if and when prices come into that area. And that those levels are sitting just above the highs. Now, if you think about it, look at that. So if the Aussie dollar just does reach that 72, 65, 66 type area, it will have made a new, um, you know, a new high for the month, actually probably a new high for a couple months, right? What do most people do uh, when when the market's breaking out to like a new high, do they get bullish or bearish? What do most people do? do they get bullish or bearish? Yeah, most most people around the world get bullish. All these bullish signals come out, and everybody just starts buying. So now everybody starts buying, right? And now price reaches the supply, the supply zones, which is where you can fill those orders. Now the last buy order from those, you know, big breakout traders is filled. Uh, what's the next move in price, up or down? Right, yeah, down. Exactly, down to where? Where's price going to fall to? Right. Yeah, demand. I mean, we just described how you know markets work uh, all the time. Okay, but most people play it wrong because they're not focused on what's real; they're focused on what they feel. Um, anyway, I think you get the point. Okay, let's move on to, let's look at the yen. Let's see what we had in the yen. Yeah, there's some larger time frame levels. Um, uh, yes, options all the time, Charlie. Um, m my main focus is options and futures. So not options on futures, but uh, options on ETFs. And, and you can do options on anything, obviously. ETFs, some stocks mainly ETFs and uh, and then of course uh, you know you can trade options on futures Forex whatever all right and you could sell calls above supply um, are you talking about like doing some 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 type of uh, spread some like bear call spread or something you can do that um, but the better you get at supply and demand, the whole strategy, the more, yeah, the more you're wanna, gonna want to sort of um, put a position on that really takes advantage of direction, you know, directionally just being right. In other words, you, the more you, the more you, the better you get at the strategy, the more you're just gonna use options as replacement for the underlying. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Right, and for those that are new to options, there's really two ways that, there's two types of positions overall that you can put on. A lot of people, most of the world says directional, non-directional. I don't, I don't like to use those words because at the end of the day, is, is there such a thing as non-directional trading? Right, not really. I mean, uh, direction, <laughs> direction comes into play for everything, trust me. Um, so I don't like to use those terms because they're not, especially that non-directional, that's not very real um, or realistic. It's attractive. But, uh, but it's not real. So I find a better way to think about it is you're putting on a position that, um, you know, where you, you know, a position that makes money because you think price is going to go somewhere or the opposite position or, or another type of position, um, you're, you're kind of betting that price isn't going to go somewhere, right? So there's positions, options and positions that, pr that you'll profit if price you know, turns and moves in your direction. There's other ones where you're, you're, you're profit if price doesn't go somewhere. Does that make sense? That's kind of a, a little bit better way to think about it because when you think non-directional trading, it's like, oh, direction doesn't matter. No, trust me, it matters. Okay, you can't get away from that. But it's okay that a lot of people think you can. 
Um, that's, uh, that's what makes a market. So if we look at the yen, we start with our larger time frame four hour chart. The other day we got close to this demand zone at 91, uh, about 91.20, didn't, uh, didn't quite get there. And uh, sitting just above current price, these are some levels that are uh, relatively new for us. Starting around 92.12, 92.13, right? Now think about it. I wanna go back here for a second. Think about this picture, because it's so important that you understand the logic. Um, if we were to replace this middle section with, you know, candlesticks or, or bars or whatever, would there be a lot of candles in here or a few? Remember, you're looking now at the picture of um, unfilled orders. Right, a lot. What about out here at supply? Um, would there be lots of candles, like there's many stick figures, or there, would there be very few? If we are actually looking at, you know, willing demand, willing supply, unfilled orders. Yeah, few, right, very few. Think about that, now let's look at the chart. What does all this trading down here represent? Filled orders or unfilled orders? What does all this represent? Filled orders, yes. What do, what do these two pictures represent? Filled orders or unfilled orders? Yeah, right, unfilled orders. Make sense? Unfilled orders cause prices to turn. Filled orders facilitate price movement, okay? Just like here, filled orders, unfilled orders. All right, see how the visual is literally opposite? Yeah, it's not great, but um, but it's okay. It's okay, if you look at the larger time frames, it's okay. All right. Okay, let's keep going. Um, oh, the Swiss had a level, it's not that close to current price, so I'm gonna make sure you have it, <clears throat> so I don't forget. It was on its way there the other day. Um, this could certainly turn around, but if we do get uh, up to this, uh, you have like two levels on top of each other. I know it's a big area, but there's also a big profit zone. Price could certainly move lower than this. Okay. Um, yeah, trend. So, yeah, Charlie, you never hear me talk about trend too much because uh, everybody gets confused with trend because someone will say, oh, this market's in an uptrend. Well, yeah, in that time frame it is. But then they'll look at a different time frame and say, no, it's in a downtrend. No, it's in an uptrend. No, it's in a downtrend. And then, and then how do you play it, right? So um, remember, I come from the trading floor, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, where I was handling buy and sell orders. So <laughs> I see your, your post there. Uh, that was pretty funny. Um, you know, on a trading floor at a you know, professionals at a bank, financial institution, no one is walking around saying the trend is up so we should buy or the trend is down so we should sell. That's not what, that's not how this, that's not how the professionals talk about it or think about it. Here are our wholesale prices, we're buying here. Here are our retail prices, we're selling here. Okay. Now, once price, you know, where does every uptrend begin? at a demand zone. Where does every downtrend, where does every uptrend end and a downtrend begin? At a supply zone, right? So if that's the case, then why not just enter it supply and demand? And then as the trend, you know, as price starts moving in your direction and the trend develops, you're now in, in the position getting paid. Let me ask you another thing. How do people define trend? What are, what are, the, what are the ways, you know, or some of the very popular ways that people define trend? Like, how do you figure out what the trend is? There's one or two really, really popular ways that everybody uses. Yeah, higher highs and higher lows, right. Or maybe a moving average. So let me ask you this. And again, I was, my brain was developed on the professional side of the business. So I see things a little bit different. So let me ask you this. <clears throat> everybody out there is, you know, consuming information on the internet, reading trading books, all this stuff. And everybody hears about this higher highs and higher lows concept. So 
Um, so most people, you know, the average person is going to watch a market, and once they see how many higher highs do you need, for example, for it to be an actual uptrend, for it to be defined as an uptrend. Okay, two. Two or three, all right, oh, let's go with your two. So you need two higher highs and two higher lows. Okay, and this is how I'm saying this is how a retail novice trader thinks. So you need, you need two, two higher highs, two higher lows. And that's in like every trading book ever written. It's all over the internet. Um, but let me ask you this. When you have those, when you actually have those two higher highs and two higher lows, what have a lot of people already done? What's already happened? What have a lot of people already done? How is that picture created? Like, like what, is, what have a lot of people already done to create that higher high and higher low picture? Right, they bought. You had a lot of, a lot of buying took place to make that happen. So now you finally get the picture that you're waiting for, higher highs and higher lows. And now you're able, now the, the trigger, you know, now you can go in and buy, right? It's like, okay, I have my higher highs and higher lows. Now it's time to buy. But you have to wait for that picture. If you think about it, why can't, would you like to be a part of that picture? In other words, that group that already bought, why does that always have to be somebody else? Like, why can't it be you? You see my point? Why does it always have to be some, why do you have to wait for all these other people to buy and then you start buying? Or all these other people to sell and then you start selling? Look, there's a reason why most people are not successful speculating in the markets. Okay, there's a reason. It's because they, you know, I've said this a million times, how you make money buying and selling in, in the financial markets for daily income, weekly income, building and protecting that long-term wealth, how you make money there is exactly how you make money buying and selling anything else in life, okay? Buy it wholesale, sell it retail. All of a sudden, though, when you come into the trading world, there's all this stuff introduced that has nothing to do with that the basic concept of how you make money buying and selling anything, all these, all this goofy stuff, these chart patterns and, and all this weird math and, and trend and all, all this other stuff, right? It's not that trend's not important. I love trend. When I'm in a position, okay, when I'm in a position, um, I'll show you this one here. This is yesterday, and some of you may have been in my session yesterday morning. Um, the trend overnight in the S&P was down, 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 down. We bought right here. I bought right here, okay? But the trend was down. By the time you had higher highs and higher lows, price is up here. Now everybody else starts buying, right? And now price is like up into here. Um, so I love that. I mean, I love trend because, you know, when people see that uptrend or downtrend, they're going to start buying and selling just like here. Okay. I told you I took a short position here. So, you know, once you get another lower high and lower low, now all the trend people are going to come in and pay those of us that are in the position already. Does that make sense? Okay. And I don't want to like beat this up too much. I just want to make sure I'm, I'm here for you. So I want to make sure that you guys understand it. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, everybody's not looking. I see your, your comment there. Everybody's not looking at the same zones. Um, and remember, here's, a, here's another thing. Don't think that like a bank or financial institution is looking at supply and demand zones. They're creating the zones. All I'm looking for is where are the footprints of the smart money? People say, well, Goldman Sachs is never going to tell you what they're actually doing. No, maybe maybe it's not going to come out of their mouth, but I can see it on the chart. I can show you exactly where the smart money is buying and selling. You see my point? <clears throat> yeah, it, it, yeah. So Ravi, so not yeah. Obviously, not every trade is going to work. Um, the majority should, and as long as you keep your risk reward in line, you're good. Okay. Um, but what you need to do, what most people you know, are not good at and need to get good at is identifying those real supply and demand zones, okay? There, there's supply and demand all over the place. Obviously, every every price point has supply and demand, right? That's a market. What we care about is identifying those significant levels, right? Where, 
again, the, the big smart money is, is buying and selling. Does anybody have another market they want to look at? Uh, again, I have no problem going through my list. We can look at oil next. And um, here's a trade from the, uh, the, the morning session yesterday, and we may have another opportunity here where, or this is a couple days ago, price hit our supply zone, and that was, um, that was the easy money target. And then here's the bigger money target. But, um, you know, if price goes a little bit deeper into this upper zone, it looks like it already did that, and it's kind of peeling off a little bit. But we might have a shorting opportunity there. And then um, uh, just a little bit higher, we do have some significant supply once you get above 54.50. Okay. Uh, yeah, we can look at the British pound. Let's do that. You, um, we can look at the spot. Let's pull up the spot market. Okay. So, um, oops, let me see here. There we go. Let me uh, just change these for you so you can see it. All right, so you can see the pound is sitting in this level up here, um, the, uh, the supply zone. We've been back and touched it once. Now we've gone fairly deep into it. Um, but notice again, prices rallied quite a bit to get there, and now it's struggling. Uh, Chris, I'll, let me get to that in just a minute. So that's a larger time frame. That's a four-hour chart of the pound. And um, uh, I don't know that we need to spend too much time on the daily chart. But uh, let's see what we have in the smaller time frames here for the pound. Yeah, the pound's been great. Um, yeah, so I would just focus on, you know, we've got that supply to the left. If price does fall, it does have quite a bit of room. Okay. So, again, now's not the time, obviously, to buy the pound. If anything, you're going to short it up here. And you could see what, you know, you could see the weekly chart and all that. All right. So we've been up here before. Just keep in mind, this is not a fresh area that we're into. You have to go above 113.30. I'm sorry. Yeah, you have to go above. I'm sorry. Hold on a second. No, yeah, I'm sorry. You have to go above 130. Let's call it 133 even. You have to go above 133 even to get into fresh territory in the bigger picture, if that's what you're asking uh, about. Yeah, so Chris is asking a good question. Is there any value using an indicator, maybe like RSI's confirmation when you hit a supplier demand zone? The way you're mentioning it is the only possible way that I would consider using it. Meaning, you don't need, um, if you, you know, using any of those indicators on their own, I've never seen anybody make money doing that. Because until price reaches their supply or demand zone, it's not going to turn. But if, but if there's a strong move up, all your overbought oscillators are going to tell you to be shorting, and you're going to get killed doing that. So making your supply and demand zones your primary decision-making uh, you know, the, the primary part of your decision-making process, and then adding something like an RSI or a Stochastics or MACD or something, um, looking for, you know, because at RSI, it'll, it'll spit out sell signals all the time or buy signals all the time. But when those buy or sell signals are given in at supplier demand, when you have a nice big profit zone, that's when you would want to take it. And it, Chris, it sounds like that's what you might be doing already. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, yeah, viral. That's uh, yeah. I bold your bands. I throw that in there too. So, again, when there's a strong move, price is going to complete. You know, continue to pierce the upper or lower band, whichever way it's moving. But when price is piercing the upper lower band, and it's into a fresh supplier demand zone, that also has a nice big profit zone with it. That's when you want to take that signal. Sure, we can go back to let's. We looked at the euro futures uh, for quite a while. Let's go to the spot. Okay, so you can see in the larger time frame, we're just wedged, kind of right in the middle on the weekly chart here, in between supply and demand. We've had these levels up for in here for uh, months. I'm just sitting in between there. As we come down to something like the four hour chart, this is the level we had from our, our morning sessions, but now we've come a long ways and um, you're gonna have some supply in here. I know it's ugly, 
but uh, there, there's you know there's going to be some supply in there. And then as we go down to smaller time frames, okay, um, a couple areas we might want to uh, think about buying the euro. Right. So to find our demand zones, we start with current price. We go down and left until we find our zones. Okay, there's that. And that. Sure, absolutely, absolutely, Charlie. But I would also, whatever pair you're going to focus on, I would also make sure you focus on the dollar as well. That's, uh, that's really important. Okay. All right. So uh, in the euro, yeah, in the, uh, if you look at the 60-minute chart, we'd um we have a couple demand zones sitting on top of each other <coughs> and notice too price would have to travel quite a ways down to get there so if and when prices get here and should you choose to buy you'll be buying from a seller who's selling after a big drop in price and into a price level where the chart is suggesting banks are buying okay these are not um very high quality levels but they're okay they're fine and when I say that, I'm specifically thinking about our odds enhancers, which you don't have enough time to go over uh, today. Uh, this space right here, yeah, no, we wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't qualify for us. Okay. All right, and, and uh, one of the things that makes these not high probability, they're fine, look, low risk, and um, should, should you know, I'd be surprised if you didn't get a nice, nice, uh, nice turn here, but... Um, notice how there's no significant supply to the left. That's a that that's one of the key things that tells you. Like like a lot of people have an issue. They say they say Sam, I see a lot of supply demand zones on a chart. Some of them work perfect, others don't. What's the difference? This is one of those factors. When you find demand, for example, and you look to the left, you don't see opposing supply zones that that uh, price had to work through. You know, be careful with those levels. They're, they're a little bit, it's not that they can't work, they're just lower probability. Okay, that's the euro. And um, it's about, I see our time is up here. But let me give you my, um, let me do this. So here is my new email address. So it's sam.sidon at tradingacademy.com. All right. Yeah, Carla, all, all, we're, all we're saying here, look, is um, this is no, you know, again, how you make money doing this is exactly how you make money buying and selling anything in life. It's just wholesale and retail. I'm interchanging the words wholesale and demand and retail and supply and simply showing you what that looks like on a price chart. And um, I come from the professional side of the business. I, I worked on the trading floor and for a big institution. And um, again, that's uh, I'm just showing what those orders look like on a price chart. Does that make sense? All right. Um, yeah, there's my email, sam.sidon at tradingacademy.com. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. All right, it was great to be with all of you. And we'll see you next time. I think we have another session coming up soon. And uh, yeah, see you next time.